everyone. Uh, th thank you for joining the SAMPI webinar. Welcome. It's the SAMPI Wind Power, Sustainability, and End-of-Life Blade Reuse Advances and Challenges webinar. We are really pleased that we have uh, some great industry experts, not only from the U.S., but also from Europe today. We also have an excellent moderator, so we're very pleased to offer this uh, complimentary SAMPI webinar to you. My name is Raj Manchanda, and I'm the Chief Technology Officer of SAMPI North America, and Ms. Rocio Figueroa, Program Manager, Education and Technology on my team is managing the presentation for SAMPI. As we, we are not, uh, we will start shortly in a few minutes, but uh, while we enter the webinar, please enter in your, your name, your company, and your geographic location in the chat. So once again, welcome to SAMPI's Wind Power webinar. Please enter in your name, your company, and where you are located geographically in the chat. We'll start shortly in a few minutes. Thank you. So please go ahead and enter that into the chat. Your name, your company name, and where you're located. Don't be, don't be shy, folks. Please, somebody start. Thank you, everyone, for joining uh, today's SAMPI webinar. We, uh, we see you coming in. Thank you so much. There's some information being played about our uh, technical committees. If you uh, do not, if you're not a member of one of the technical committees, we'd like for you to uh, consider joining. There's no cost to join a SAMPI technical committee. They are available on our 365 platform. But thank you. I see folks uh, signing up for the, uh, we have Ted Lynch, past president, Tanaya, head of uh, TC3. Uh, thank you for joining. Hi, Robert Brushaber. So folks are starting to chime in. Thank you. Again, welcome to SAMPI's Wind Power webinar. We are very glad to have you here today for the hour. My name is Raj Manchanda, and my colleague, Ms. Rocio Figueroa, is uh, managing this webinar. Welcome to the Wind Power Sustainability and End of Life Blade Reuse Advances and Challenges webinar. We will begin shortly. Those of you who have just joined, please enter your name, your company, and geographic location in the chat. Thank you. We'll start shortly. Folks, keep joining in. Oh, Dr. Beckwith, thank you for joining. And you can see our esteemed panelists and our moderator on the screen for now. We have uh, Steve Nolet. We have uh, Alberto Cabello and uh, Spencer Hawkins, Dr. Spencer Hawkins. Thank you for joining from uh, the uh, Prague, Yosef. Uh, uh, Thank you so much. It's again, SAMPI is a global organization. So we appreciate everyone joining. Please go ahead and enter that into your chat, your name, what, where you work, and where you're located. Thank you, Bob, for joining from San Diego. Lou, thank you for joining from uh, Nevada. I believe I'm going to go ahead and start now since we're at the hour. Uh, good morning, colleagues, or good afternoon. Uh, greetings wherever you are. My name is Raj Manchanda, and I'm the Chief Technology Officer of SAMPI North America, and Ms. Rocio Figueroa, Program Manager Education and Technology on my team, is managing this presentation for SAMPI. As I had requested previously, please enter your name, company, and geographic location in the chat so we could learn more about you. On behalf of our CEO, Ms. Rebecca Stacha, President Sarah Cox, and the other members of the Executive Cabinet, we welcome you to the SAMPI Technical Committee's second webinar on wind power, sustainability, and end-of-life blade reuse advances and challenges, delivered by Steve Nolet, Principal Engineer, Senior Director, Innovation and Technology at TPI Composites, and Alberto Lario Caballo. Manager of European Projects at ATIP Centro Tecnologico in uh, Spain. SAMPI currently offers seven technical committees, and we invite you to join a technical committee of your choice. The technical committees provide year-long education and networking opportunities for experts, early career professionals, and graduate students. They're a great way to start getting more involved with SAMPI in addition to our chapters. The te technical committees typically meet virtually for approximately one hour each month or every other month and twice a year in person at the SAMPI Spring Conference 
and which this year or coming up will be held May 20 to 23, 2024 in Long Beach and our uh, CAMEX Expo, which will be offered from October 30th to November 2nd in Atlanta. You can join a technical committee of your choice on SAMPI's 365 platform. The technical committees are open to members and non-members. The leaders are SAMPI members. The technical committees provide year-long education and networking opportunities for experts, early career professionals, and as I mentioned, graduate students. A few weeks ago, SAMPI released the State of the Technology Industry Report, which was developed by the seven technical committees. Please download your complimentary copy from the SAMPI online store at nasampi.org. One more, that's nasampi.org. Composites World has announced the SAMPI State of the Technology Industry Report to its audience. IACME and JEC will be doing the same. Technical committees are open to global participants from industry, academia, and government and offer a convenient platform for all to learn, network, and discuss trends and collaborate on the development of industry solutions. Again, please join a technical committee of your choice and contribute to a future SAMPI State of the Technology Industry Report. If you'd like to learn more about the report, there's a press release from our marketing director, Ms. Chris Locke, which can be made available. The SAMPI sales team has developed special custom sponsorship opportunities for future TC webinars. So if your company is interested in learning more, please contact my colleague, Mr. Jordan Stewart. Jordy is on the call today, so we'll uh, have him enter his information in the chat. Now I'll introduce Dr. Spencer Hawkins, Chair of SAMPI's Technical Committee, TC4, Recycling of Composites, who will serve as moderator for today's presentation. Spencer is a Composites R&D Engineer at TRI Austin. Thank you, Spencer, and thank you all for joining our webinar. All right, welcome everybody. I just wanna remind everybody that this webinar will be recorded. So if you had any questions about that, you know, it's gonna come out probably a week after this is done. If you have any questions about a week after this, we, you can direct them to Rocio. Also, any Q&A that you have, that'll be done at the end of the presentation, but please feel free to enter in any of the questions that you have into the Q&A down at the bottom in the center. We'll get to those questions at the end. And then without further ado, I'll introduce our first speaker. So like Raj had said, we have Steve Nolet here. It's nice getting to meet Steve over at uh, Sampi and Camex. He's going to be giving a presentation about wind power materials and sustainable pathways. He is Senior Director of Innovation and Technology at TPI Composites and has over two decades of experience supporting activities for utility scale and wind energy. In his role at TPI, he manages the company's external research and development efforts. And recently, he has focused on creating a sustainable circular economy for end-of-life fiber reinforced composites, specifically because of the growing number of decommissioned wind turbine blades that are going to be coming offline here in the recent future. Mr. Nolet has over 40 years of experience working in the development of fiber reinforced polymers and products for industries such as aerospace, recreational, industrial energy applications. He received his bachelor's degree and master's degree in aeronautical engineering from MIT. So without further ado, you take it away, Steve. Thank you, Spencer. You hear me okay? Everything's good? All right. Um, let's, let's, first of all, let me thank Raj and Rocio, Spencer, and the SAMPI organization for inviting me to, to have the opportunity to address this group and, and to all of you who are attending and putting up with my, uh, with, with, with my presentation for the next 20 or 25 minutes. I'm going to talk about um, um, the um, circular economy and specifically the uh, challenges um, and opportunities associated with end-of-life wind turbine blades. Um, let's start by just recognizing, right, we've been a very successful industry. Um, recent numbers show that we've, we've attained over 145 gigawatts of installed capacity, which is close to 10% of the entire electrical generating capacity for wind. Rotor size continues to grow. Turbine um, rating continues to grow. Average wind turbine length today or blade, blade length today is about 65 meters, 127 meter rotor diameters and 3.1 megawatt capacity, which is enough to power something on the order of 1,400 to 1,800 homes, depending on electrical use and siting and location. At the same time, 
our offshore activity is starting to spark up. Uh, the, um, the, the current administration's goal for 30 gigawatts of offshore wind by 2030 has sparked and in, initiated a great deal of investment, including uh, a, 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 an offshore wind port and marshalling hub that is being constructed in the, the mouth of the Delaware River in South uh, uh, New Jersey. I'll be ready. Uh, it's about 60% complete now. We'll be ready and come online by 2024, just as some of these major projects in the North Atlantic, uh, North, Northeast and the Mid-Atlantic uh, uh, begin to um, be developed. It turns out that um, wind energy, uh, electrons generated by wind power, is the lowest form of generated electrical power. We've got over 25 years of demonstrated utility scale reliability, and we continue to see um, um, growth in storage that increases the value of those electrons and, and support peaking um, um, for um, uh, high load generation. Economically responsible for over 120,000 jobs in North, North America alone, over $20 billion, about $26 billion of, elect, of economic um, activity, and 24,000 of those jobs are in manufacturing uh, facilities around the country. The, the environmental impact is terrific, over 330 million tons of CO2 is offset through wind power, and hundreds of billions of gallons of water are conserved on an annual basis. With all that, the economic benefits, the consumer benefits, the job manufacturing jobs, what's not to love? Well, we all know this is probably one of the most um, well-published um, photos uh, that I've seen in the last 30 years. Um, on February 5th in 2020, Bloomberg published this article about landfill of wind turbine blades, and uh, it got everybody's attention very quickly. Of course, I would say that the industry was well aware before the 5th of February in 2020 that, that we had to address the sustainability and the end of life of wind turbine blades. But that it's no question that the um, public's focus um, impacted both ESG scoring and, and shape that, that public opinion shapes investors' decisions. We reacted quickly. So we turned our attention to sustainability of wind turbine blades, and uh, often you'll see you'll see um, a circular economy um, described as a series of loops uh, at, with inner circle, inner loops, and more inner loops. I kind of prefer this uh, inverted pyramid look towards the thought of sustainability, which includes prevention, reuse, repurposing, recycling, recovery, and ultimately what we try to avoid is the disposal and the loss of that embodied energy um, through landfill or other means where the waste is simply um, uh, taken off our books and not, and not maintained. What I'd like to do is look primarily at recycling and recovery area. Um, um, prevention and reuse today with wind turbine blades is not particularly practical. Blades are coming off a tower is not because they've reached the end of their life and they're ready to fall off and it's decrepit. They're, they're being replaced by because of obsoleted technology. Um, generally, um, the, the lowest, the, the earliest wind turbines were put in some of the most productive wind sites. And now with advances in technology and with the scaling of the capacity factor and the um, rated capacity of these turbines, re repowering and replacement is the norm. But let's talk a little bit about repurposing. I think mo most of us or some of us may have seen these kinds of photos of, of bicycle sheds or other, other um, uh, protection systems that are fashioned from uh, wind turbine blades that have been disposed. And others have dreamed about cutting up and, and filleting a wind turbine blade to create building products or other applications. And as it turns out, it's becoming it's becoming industrialized. It's becoming commercialized with a company with companies like Canvas that are, is are turning end of life wind turbine blades into community properties, uh, benches and seating areas and gardens and the like. Um, it's happening, and they've 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 taken a particularly clever approach using social media as a way of spreading the good news and expanding their footprint. I still wonder about repurposing only because I don't believe that the total capacity of wind turbine blades could be consumed through that type of, of effort. But if we look at TPI's perspective of recycling or recovery of embodied energy, 
TPI is a company and most of the OEMs and other blade manufacturers are committed to finding end of life solutions that avoid landfill. In fact, avoiding landfill altogether. The need is immediate. 2021 alone, we had 8,000 blades decommissioned and that number is simply ratcheting upwards with new repowering efforts. Globally, it's the same problem. The EU will de decommission over 2,500 tons of wind turbine blades by 2025, a large number in their uh, geography as well. The goal is primarily to recapture the embodied energy. We think of products as containing embodied energy. It's that it's, that's what will determine the footprint, the carbon footprint that a commercial product um, um, uh, emits. And so we would like to capture that embodied energy and provide power for other industrial processes or and reclaim those materials for other uses in new products. Today, viable solutions are currently available, and we'll look at some of those um, this afternoon or this morning. Um, the challenge, though, is to make them economically viable. TPI, we're targeting solutions with an economic business cases that are sustainable you know, sometime in the next 18 to 24 months. We're looking towards seeing scaling and increasing volume to drive costs down, and we're actively partnering with other industry partners to drive and create a complete value chain. Talk about that a little bit more. I think it's worth noting that carbon is already found um, and is actively reclaimed, reused because of its intrinsic high value. Well, we're not alone with this viewpoint. This, um, after the Bloomberg article, there were several of our customers that made their announcements related to recycling. GE with, with the um, um, liquid helium blade, um, the Vestas is, is working with Olin on a recovery of, of conventional epoxy resin systems from wind turbine blades. And Siemens Gamesa made, uh, uh, made their announcement related to the use of cleavable epoxy systems for low energy recovery of the materials. But I have to ask the question and the challenge that remains is have they really closed the loop? Have we created a value chain? If any one of these blades today comes to end of life, who do we turn to to take that blade, to reduce it in size, to process it, to create and to extract and create new products? Um, that, that's the task that remains and the critical mass that needs to, to be created. I like to think of blade end of life in three time horizons. Kind of, I've referred to it as either the, the current state the near future state or the active state? What are we working on with those blades that are already up on towers? And, and what can we do in a future state to build blades that are more disassemblable and more ready to be recycled? Let's talk first about the current state. Regardless of the um, pathway that we would choose at the end of life of a blade, all of the, the solutions require one, the removal of the blade with cranes on site. And those are, that's fairly significant dollars. We have field level reduction. We have cleanup and transportation of the debris. And we have the transport of those materials to some downstream processing site or a landfill and disposal. Just that alone is expensive. And generally at the gate where we dispose of these blades, we encounter tipping fees, and those may be anywhere from $75 a ton up to over $500 a ton to dispose of those materials, whatever the downstream pathway may be. And of course, the resulting materials that are recovered tend to have much lower value than just the cost of the recovery alone. Those applications that we have found originally aggregate for asphalt or, or reinforcements in bricks and tiles, or using the organic material, the matrix and adhesives and core materials to fuel cogeneration, co typically results in a cost of recovery that far exceeds the value of those materials. We think about one, the field level removal of blades, you know, the turbine decommissioning is going to include that large expense to remove the blades. We're going to be using rock saws or chainsaw type or hydraulic shears or wire cutters to reduce the blade into bite sized pieces, because we certainly don't want to move the blade in its entirety, requiring escorted uh, vehicles and, uh, and permitting. We want legal loads. So reducing the blade at the very least into bite sized chunks is the norm. So we have heavy move, we have heavy equipment on site to reduce the blades. 
And from there, we can either ship them as bite-sized pieces, which you can see still consume. You're still shipping a lot of air rather than tearing out the load uh, um, by weight. We're cubing out the load by its volume. The question remains for TPI, we've, we, is, is field le further field level reduction economically viable, or should we do additional field level reduction at a process plant? We've worked on and down-selected mobile shredding equipment to work at, with field level trials and, and, um, uh, and, and recently conducted um, field level reduction trials on a Siemens Gamesa 114 wind turbine blade. With whole sections of blades fed into the machine, the mobile machine can rapidly reduce the material to, to, to 200 millimeter uh, or, or smaller shreds. We can adjust the screen size, the smaller the shred, the more time on station and the more cost. And dust containment and other um, um, factors can increase your cost in the field to make sure that you clean up the debris and leave the field in an acceptable condition. Also, separation of non-composite components, metallic components, T-bolts, and inserts, lightning protection systems uh, in the form of the cables and receptors is, in, is important. Some preliminary costing has shown that to the net cost is somewhere between 14 cents and 18 cents per pound for this field level activity. That needs to be offset by reduction in cost of transportation. Then, of course, the, we, we have to truck these materials. Uh, the, whether it's the shredding operation is done um, in the field or in the plant, we still need that material to be moved uh, for further transportation. By field level reduction, we can use, you know, um, we can tear out loads by weight as opposed to cubing out loads and sh shipping a lot of air. No additional special handling equipment is necessary either. It can be um, uh, moved with bucket loaders or the like, right? Once we're in a process plant, what can we do? What are our pathways for successful downstream processing? Well, we generally break this down into three operations, looking at mechanical systems that might be grinding or milling or some form of other energy pulse fragmentation to separate cured fiber, uh, uh, cured resin from fiber. That generally is creating um, fairly low value particulate, uh, whether it's staples of fiber or powders or granular materials used for aggregate reinforcement. Process costs, tend to be greater uh, than the material value itself. Similarly, if we have thermal processes, such as a pyrolysis operation, that through, an, uh, um, um, through no zero oxygen um, combustion of these materials, we can separate fiber from resin with heat. We can obtain larger fibers as a result. Discontinuous fibers in general, we don't feed continuous uh, full blades, so they're reduced in size to feed the pyrolysis process. But these materials can find their way into sheet molding compounds, bulk molding compounds, or some other material systems that we'll talk about in a little bit. Again, though, the question remains, what about the process costs? What about the material value? Where can these end up that will justify this use of a process to gain these materials back? Worth noting, both carbon fiber and glass fiber can be extracted through these thermal processes. And then finally, we talk about chemical reduction through sevolysis and dissolving the resin, recovering longer length fibers, hopefully with less fiber degradation than many of our thermal processes um, um, a result in challenge, of course, is these are high energy input through heating of very um, caustic um, um, uh, solvents, uh, nitric acid, uh, benzyl alcohols, uh, very um, not, not particularly environmentally friendly solvents either, resulting in organic sub substances and organic compounds and reclaimed fibers. Typically, the pathways we've seen recently some hybrid. Um, um, processes where a chemical sulfolysis pre, um, is, is done before a pyrolysis, which reduces the energy required in pyrolysis and less fiber degradation. So we're seeing some blurring of the lines as well. But I would, I would suggest that uh, these are the primary pathways that today um, have been um, demonstrated at industrial level. Many of you may be aware of probably the most successful post-life 
process for wind turbine blades and 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 scrap um, uh, end of life composite materials, and that's the thermal processing of the material in cement kilns. Um, the cement kiln method of co-processing is a, a true alternative. It consumes 100% of the wind turbine blade. Um, inorganic materials uh, become part of the cement itself, the clink clinkers as they're called, and the organic materials, the, the adhesives, the bond paste, the, the, the resins of the, of the matrix system, and our core materials become fuel for the kiln and reduce the coal necessary to be burned for the conversion in the cementing process. More than 65% of the blade weight displaces the raw materials in the in the kiln. So we're we're displacing one for one mined materials and reducing the um, uh, embodied energy uh, necessary to build the kiln. And um, studies have shown about 27% reduction in carbon emission versus coal film coal. Kiln, um, kiln processing with coal. Today's implementation still requires a significant tipping, tipping fee. I've seen those fees range anywhere from $400 to over $500 per ton, but it is a viable approach. Still emits carbon into the atmosphere, but it offsets that same carbon that would be used to make that volume of cement. I like to I'll turn our attention now more to an active state. What are we working on today? I, I, I would I would just point out, you know, for TPI, we're, we we have engagements across um, um, uh, government, academia, industry with our materials suppliers and waste management companies. This is by no means um, the entirety of the landscape of activity in composite su sustainability, but it is an example of the footprint TPI has spread uh, and the engagements we currently are active in, in one form or another. And all of these, at the end of the day, are looking for new user applications. And I, I point out, we're still looking for the killer app. It's worth noting, too, that some of our national network of manufacturing institutes, IACME, the Institute for Advanced Composite Manufacturing Innovation, and the Remade Institute are, are, are actively involved in these, this work also, which represents, again, a, a landscape of, of government, academia, and industry participants. Talk about a simple example, I, I, and I think maybe one of those kinds of examples that could consume a great deal of reclaimed fiber. You may be familiar with cured in place pipe for rehabilitating uh, our infrastructure. Primarily, SIP is a, a very uh, it's it's not an, it's not a new process. It's been around since the, at least the mid to early 1980s. It's a process in which we can reline our infrastructure, mostly waste lines or high or or um, water mains with a liner that's composed of polyester felt that's saturated with a reactive resin. It's blown into an existing pipeline, expanded against the wall of the pipeline and cured in place. And that pipeline is put back on line without digging up the streets. Cool idea. Well, TPI is engaged with Textec um, Textiles, which is a company that uh, um, specializes in, in uh, uh, we weaving of, of reinforcement materials, fiberglass, carbon fiber, um, synthetic fibers, extensive experience felting of um, uh, materials. Also, we're engaged with Carbon Rivers, working in a pyrolysis process to recover glass fiber in a short um, um, discontinuous length, and we're supporting the technical, the processing and the mechanical testing of these hybrid felts in which we're joining the glass content, recycled glass content with polyester felts. Turns out when you hybridize like that, you can create tremendous improved properties, both in tensile and in bending. And the level of hybridization goes up with the, the, the uh, increases the properties almost linearly. 
we're working today to find the sweet spot of, uh, of glass content with with uh, filler with uh, f um, felt content. But the result will be creating some liners and do and performing trial installations, reducing the amount of of um, with the improved properties. We reduce the amount of uh, resin necessary and the thickness of the liner, both improving the economics, but also increasing the flow characteristics of the of the line. On another activity, we're working with a company in New Smyrna Beach, a small marine company that already has created their own circular economy for their waste. River's Edge Composites is grinding and then hammer milling scrap and waste composite materials. And we've, we've, hammer, we've done similar work with them on end-of-life wind turbine blades and mixing with a binder material to create and pressing to create construction panels. We're, we're focused on phenolic resins to, build, to create panels to be used in construction, whether it's cladding, roofing systems, and the like for new construction systems that will never rot, that will never be wasted. Working on a very similar project with another company out of Charleston, Carolina, Green Text, um, um, to press materials. But their scheme is kind of interesting. It's to take shredded end-of-life blade material and sandwich it between discontinuous reclaimed fiber, blending it with resin, pressing out panels that have much higher um, um, structural and mechanical properties for intermodal containers, truck trailers, and the like. PPI is engaged with the University of Tennessee at Knoxville to create new um, material forms from recovered fiberglass as well taking short discontinuous fiber from a pyrolysis um, operation, carting that material, spinning the material and bringing it back into a yarn provides opportunities to, to reuse these discontinuous materials in more conventional textile applications, both non-woven or woven textiles, filament winding and the like. In fact, last fall, we won an ACE award at the CAMEX show after launching a rocket our first uh, launch vehicle using filament wound yarns created from recycled wind turbine blades. Finally, I'm going to talk just really briefly about liquid helium. You're probably familiar with liquid helium, which is a, uh, a liquid thermoplastic material. It react it, it, it with low viscosity allows it to be utilized much like a thermal set material. But when it polymerizes, it doesn't crosslink. And as a result, we have an in-situ polymerization without cross-linking. And by the way, that's a thermoplastic material, a polymethyl methacrylate um, um, thermoplastic, allows us to build thermoplastic parts with very, very favorable properties. In fact, nearly a drop-in replacement for our epoxy systems we build in blades. Thermoplastic material processed like a thermal set. And that sounds great because we all think of, of thermal set, thermoplastic uh, composite materials as being inherently recyclable. I have a little different view on that. I think they're decyclable, but uh, they can be ground and, and used. Now, I, I actually think the more interesting approach with the liquid helium is to depolymerize and return the material back to a near pure polymer, a uh, monomer that can be reprocessed to build new wind turbine blades and leave behind larger more continuous fibers for creating things like the spun yarns that we're talking, that we're working with the University of Tennessee. Similarly, you might be um, familiar with recyclamine, which is a, a, a cycloaliphatic amine, but the, the hook with the cycloaliphatic amines is we can build an internal cleave point within that cross-link network. And with very mild solutions, we can break that cleave and dissolve the resin. In fact, in this simple demonstration, a graphite epoxy laminate is dissolved in a acetic acid bath that's 20% by concentration vinegar for about uh, six hours at 80 degrees C. Low energy, mild caustic solution, recovered fiberglass, and a solute that can is now a thermoplastic epoxy that can be ground, compounded, and put into new applications once again, though, the economics of this isn't so clear. And what do you do with it today? Those facilities don't exist. We want to encourage new industries to form, to take these materials and build these new products. 
But let me wrap up my section by just saying, you know, there is a massive focus in the wind industry today, uh, particularly to focus on blades and the recovery of the embodied energy and materials from end of life blades. We haven't even talked about consumables. Those today go to cogeneration for the most part to recover embodied energy. Pathways uh, for sustainability exist, but the cost of processing, particularly with glass fiber composites, is challenging. That the cost of most processes remain significantly higher than landfill. Of course, we can talk about the use of new materials for future blades, and almost monthly we're seeing new materials, vitrimers, re um, reducible or disassemblable thermosets, and liquid thermoplastics that we can work with to build future blades. And, on, and nearer to us on the scene are also bio resins and natural reinforcements that would bring us into the agricultural circular economy, which we've seen for millennia is a very effective, sustainable economy. The cost challenges remain. And I'll leave it at that. And I'm going to pass it over to back to Spencer. Thank you for your attention. I apologize for the amount of time, Spencer, but thank you for your patience too. All right. Thanks a bunch. Thank you, Steve. We were supposed to have somebody come on from Tampa, North America to give a few words. Oh, uh, thank you so much. Uh, I'm going to let you have it back, Spencer. But we okay. just wanted to point out our colleague, Jordan Stewart, has mentioned that there are sponsorship opportunities for the last one. I don't believe Jordan can speak. Uh, he's short for Jordy. So please feel free to email him and let him know. Thanks, Spencer. Mm -hmm. All right. We appreciate you guys sticking around for the first one. For anybody who has joined at the end of Steve's talk and right before Albert Alberto's, this presentation will be recorded and it will be provided about a week from now. And please, if you have any Q&A, please put, put it down into the Q&A box at the bottom and center of your Zoom window. And on to our second speaker. So we have Alberto Lario Carrillo. He is the manager of European projects at ATIP Centro Tecnologico. And he is a chemical engineer by trade and he's developed in his career um, in plastics composite materials, uh, focus on reducing carbon footprint manufacturing costs by lightning structures, and advocating for the penetration of innovative materials added manufacturing and hybrid molding technologies for aerospace. He's currently completing an MBA in Innovation and Circular Economy and recently joined the ATIP Foundation. So without further ado, Alberto, you take it away. Um, yep. Okay. Thank you, Spencer, and thank you, Steve, because that was a fantastic presentation. So uh, I'm gonna start presenting a little bit of what we do in ATIP. Uh, and myself. Uh, so I'm Alberto Lario, and I would like to, sa to say thanks to Sampi for the opportunity to present today. Uh, and I hope that the audience enjoy the contents uh, that are going to be presented. Um, let me go to the next slide. Okay. So uh, I work with IT as project manager, as Spencer explained, and we are an RTO that is based in Zaragoza in Spain. And we help companies to overcome their current and future technological challenges. We are quite active in European projects, and today I'll talk about two of them uh, that are focused around wind energy and recycling of uh, aircraft components. Uh, the center is established as a private foundation, and we have a board of leading companies in the plastic processing sector. So this is really our our focus: the plastics and composites. Um, as an RTO, uh, we we'll have a very varied human capital and more than 120 people. And we invest heavily in technologies uh, that are aligned with our main uh, research uh, lines, uh, which are, as you can see, advanced materials, advanced manufacturing, recycling technologies, and sustainable solutions and products. So we try to look into projects that are at the interface of these uh, four blocks uh, where innovation usually takes place. And after this short intro, uh, I'm going to move on to present the, the first of the two projects. So I need to change to a different presentation. So bear with me. So that should be the first one. 
Okay, so uh, the first project I want to talk about is uh, HELAX, which is holistic processes for the cost effective and sustainable management of end of life of aircraft composite structures. And uh, the aim of the project is to develop and demonstrate an integral dismantling methodology to enable uh, sorting, recycling, and reusing of large composite components. So, pretty much in the in, in line with what uh, Steve has presented before. And uh, this project tackles the challenges that aircraft dismantling uh, poses, which are because of the size very similar to those that we would find in wind energy and uh, wind power sector. So basically, there is a reduced number of airports specialized in aircraft dismantling. And then you find a lot of difficulties for some aircraft to fly to the commissioning sites. So there is a need to make those parts smaller and be able to transport them or uh, do the process in situ. And this is probably a slightly different than what you would be looking at doing in uh, wind uh, power. And then another problem is that specialized recycling facilities are geographically scattered. So uh, there is a um, habit of uh, transport involved. So uh, with the HELAX project, uh, the proposal is to undertake the removal of hazardous substances, dismantling, fragmenting, and partial sorting operations uh, on site, which would enable mass transport of the materials to specialized recycling centers, and then conduct the processing and, the, and putting the materials back into the value chain through those specialized centers. So uh, the approach involves fragmentation of parts using either abrasive water yet and mechanical cutting, thermoplastic resistance, dis resistance dismantling because uh, it's, it's quite uh, common to start finding uh, aircraft with a lot of thermoplastic composites at, and it will become more and more commonplace in the future. And then finally, the identification of valorization routes to maximize uh, value retention in those uh, fibers and materials that you can recover from the structures. And in addition, the, the project uh, looks at uh, maximizing cross-pollination and technology transfer to other sectors that are facing uh, similar issues, such as wind energy, which is the, the focus of the webinar today. And the core objective uh, of the project is to increase the adoption of uh, safe, scalable, uh, and sustainable recycling processes in general for large aerostructures and composite structures. So. Uh, I'm gonna move on to the next one. So, uh, yeah, this is the the location that uh, the project uh, has considered for this uh, demonstration, which is um, an airport that is located in Teruel in Spain, uh, which aligns with the key location is identified in the project. So basically, it's an industrial airport that is very well located, uh, accessible road, railway, tra railway transport, uh, dry climatic conditions for aircraft parking and storage, and uh, access to large ex extensions of land, uh, which make it an ideal uh, point for expanding it or for conducting operations in there. Uh, at the moment, there are plans for some recycling companies to be located in the airport. So it's a, it's a hot spot uh, in this sector at the moment. And then uh, I'd like to, to move on to a bit more of the detail of the project. So as in an innovative approach, uh, we need a framework to ensure that the best practice uh, was considered. So taking it from a top-down perspective, uh, some essential aspects such as uh, the ones that you see on the screen, compliance with the standards, health and safety regulations, those, those were considered in the, in the first place. And under that overarching umbrella, the material and disassembly operations were developed, uh, things like inventory con control, materials management, as well as equipment and tooling requirements. So there was a, a bit of um, literature and industry research in finding out what's the best practice and the, the best technology available. So we could do uh, this at a demonstration level that then could be uh, scaled up uh, for industrialization. So uh, the first aspect on site decommissioning uh, clearly is, is, is one of the challenges uh, that comes to mind at this scale. 
and that is the size of the structures and the, the handling of those structures. So lifting and hoisting approaches for large structures and available technologies and equipment such as airbags and other lifting systems for fuselage, fuselage sorry about that, and overwhelming structures were explored to understand the problem and propose relevant solutions. Then at a more conceptual, conceptual level, uh, hosting tooling systems uh, would be considered to control the aircraft stability across all the operations. And then uh, with a system like this being commanded uh, by a specific software programming uh, would help uh, this aim. So the, the approach was to calculate the gravity center of the plane and of the components after its dismantling operation to ensure stability. Uh, as you can see on, a, on a screen, there may be some uh, different type of tooling and equipment around the aircraft to ensure this. And during the disassembly process also, uh, uh, we will be looking at using systems like robots, uh, automated uh, dismantling systems, which need to be held by a crane, which could be remotely operated uh, and then uh, follow the robot holding the, the, the disassembly parts by means of different types of, of tools. So this was done at conceptual level, uh, but it clearly reflects uh, the challenge of dismantling an aircraft on site uh, with, uh, with a limited uh, amount of resources because you really would want to make it cost effective to improve the value of the materials that you get at the end of the process and to make it economically viable. Um, so on the next slide, uh, we are looking at the dismantling approach again. So looking at the scale and, uh, and the materials, uh, we consider water jet cutting and mechanical cutting for uh, um, bringing the aircraft uh, down to pieces of large large uh, size and then also resistive, resistive disassembly technologies that were being relevant mainly to the flexibility and the maturity of the technologies that I've mentioned so those three were, were considered as the most uh, readily available and also cost effective and then a support system for the dismantling robot uh, is being developed in the project uh, with a special focus in the software aspect uh, the flexibility and the affordability. So as I explained before, you can contain the costs and the equipment needs and then make the operation viable for a further uh, user down the line that could make do something with the with that material. And then in the uh, lastly, the cutting automated uh, the cutting system that would be automated will require tracker systems to guide the robot and to this end uh, Things like commercial laser trackers that uh, are technology that you can get off the shelf uh, at a cost uh, quite high, or other uh, more cost effective tools uh, such as affordable uh, teaching tools or camera systems. So we explored a, little, a few of those. Uh, and then uh, one key challenge of dismantling such a large structure uh, would be analyzing the manipulation kinematics because uh, it has to do with the flexibility of the and, and the workspace management so normally with the disassembly of an aircraft or a large structure with different types of materials you will uh, find the geometrical constraints and limited access to the different areas of the aircraft structure and to that end, the positioning and the guiding of the mobile robotic system would be key to optimize the operation and to ensure that you can uh, remove the parts in, in an orderly and safe manner. Uh, then moving on to the more the specific uh, composite cutting technology. Uh, the project uh, undertook a screening of uh, different technologies, uh, as I have explained. So uh, basically, those were best technologies available, and then we tried to incorporate lessons learned from previous projects. So uh, 
in the end, a water jet cutting system uh, consisting of a pressurized water jet with an ocell diameter uh, from 0.1 to 0.4 millimeter uh, was selected. And then uh, for this problem uh, that we have at hand, the, the water jet was deemed as the most cost effective and the, uh, the system that would generate uh, low tan tangential forces and a low fast fast cutting speeds and short uh, settling time so you can switch from one material or one area of the aircraft to another and do the operation uh, quite uh, quick without a lot of uh, time waiting between uh, different areas etc and then for for those reasons the the team opted for the water air cutting that i think you can see a video in the screen and, and for the mechanical cutting technologies, uh, these were adapted to the specific uh, problem or solution that the project is trying to, to deliver. And with this, we had a set of robot and process parameters for each specific material, structure and thickness that you would typically find in a structure like this. And then you could go through composite materials, aluminium, core foams, fastened joints, etc. Indeed, there was a system developed to remove the fastened joints uh, very quickly. Uh, basically, it would destroy them in the process, but that takes a problem away because then you will have to take those materials out in the recycling process, uh, which would add costs and would be time consuming. So uh, with the water yet, uh, I, I think I've run the video, so I'm going to move on to the next one. Uh, and then for the thermoplastic uh, composite parts, uh, there was a, a, a trial uh, done. So uh, we used uh, this case to demonstrate the feasibility of dismantling thermoplastic composite structures which, as I said before, they are gaining prominence in current and future aircraft design, uh, mainly because they are, uh, as you know, uh, they provide advantages in performance processing and they are recyc uh, recyclable. So there is also a, an opportunity to take those uh, components apart by using a, a resistive or a resistance debonding system. Uh, in this case, it was optimized uh, for the parameters of the of the bond and developed uh, on top of an existing system that uh, was available and came from a resistant welding kit uh, from a previous project. So, as I said, this technology that is out there. And then for the dismantling process uh, and the robotic uh, aspect of it, the automation, um, uh, we, we took an initial approach of uh, guiding the robot through the structures uh, using an of the self uh, laser tracking system, which is quite accurate and will guide the robot effectively. Uh, however, there is a cost uh, uh, and, and a specific specificity to the equipment, uh, which was then uh, a potential barrier to wider adoption. Then it was discarded and we moved on to dummy tools uh, to teach the robot and also the use of uh, cameras and lights uh, so it could follow a, a path. And then uh, in the end there is the pyrolysis and valorization process. So uh, it was considered as a valorization route for the fibers. Uh, in this process the, the resin is removed by oxidative heating whilst the fibers are recovered. So in the pictures you can see the reclaimed fibers which are compo compounded with thermoplastic resin and then they can be introduced back in the value chain. And I believe that example in the right uh, is a high performance thermoplastic uh, resin that was compounded with the fibers. And of course, depending on the properties of the fiber that was in the aircraft at the start, then you might find it suitable for different applications, but it depends also on, on what you do to the fiber during the process. So I think uh, this is the last one of the Helax uh, project. I'm not sure how are we with time, Spencer? To move on to the next. I think we're good, Alberto. Yeah, okay, thank you. 
So uh, now I would like to move on to uh, another project, which is uh, is building on top of what we learned uh, from the previous project, and is being applied to wind turbine blades. So uh, what uh, what this project uh, proposes is a circular approach to recycling wind turbine blades, and um, the Okay, uh, so those are the contents uh, that are uh, that I'm going to try and cover to describe both the challenge and the solution proposed uh, in the time that is left. And the project den denomination is uh, YOLO Hubs, which stands for Wind Turbine Blades, end of life through open hubs for circular materials in sustainable business models. And the project coordinator in this case is ITIP, uh, and uh, it has been funded uh, under the umbrella of an innovation action of the Horizon Europe program. Uh, and it has a total time span of 48, 48 months. So uh, as you can imagine, uh, recycling wind turbine blades is not something straightforward, is not a straightforward activity. And with circular economy, you normally need the participation, multidisciplinarity, and different teams and capabilities. Uh, therefore, there is a variety of partners that are distributed across Europe working together in this project, which include six RTOs uh, for small and medium enterprise, uh, for large enterprises, and then uh, two universities and two other entities that are supporting with the communication and the, um, uh, the different aspects of the project. Uh, the, the activity of these companies, uh, some of them you would recognize them, uh, is centered around the wind industry operations, material recycling, or other sectors, which could be end users for the materials recovered from the blades. So um, uh, with, uh, with wind industry being classed as uh, green energy, it's important that uh, we define the problematic that comes with uh, wind farm decommissioning and also define how we better tackle it. And I think uh, Steve has covered quite a lot of this. So I'm happy to see that we are kind of taking same approaches uh, across the pond because it's very important that, that the value chains developed uh, come to the same conclusion and do, it, do the right thing and do it right, which is uh, are two different uh, things that come together. So uh, some consideration as to why this is a unique opportunity for wind industry. Uh, in the first place, it is, it is estimated that 70% of wind power is installed in Europe, which accounts for 14% of its total energy demand. And then we find also that older wind turbines from the late 90s are facing the commission in, in the next few years. So there's going to be a lot of material uh, that needs to be processed and needs to be processed uh, in the right way. So that is uh, kind of the driver of this uh, project consortia. So uh, the main challenge to enable transitioning from incineration, landfilling, and then move on to material reclaiming lies in the difficulty of recycling composites uh, and the value that you can retain in them or the value that you take away by trying to recycle them or putting them to use in another uh, application. So there are some technologies for this assembly and recovery that already exist. Uh, some has been, some of them were proved uh, in Helax project and some of them, Steve has covered them already in his presentation. So. However, uh, further development and optimization is needed to scale up uh, to the volume required and to set a circular value chain around uh, wind turbine blades. Uh, the advantage is that the constituent materials are valuable. Uh, they are technical uh, materials, uh, engineering materials, and in monetary terms, uh, there are other industries which could give them a second life. And the value proposition of Yolo Hubs uh, is to develop these sustainable business models for the dismantling and subsequent recycling of the wind turbine blades. And this approach relies on four pillars, uh, which are, as you can see on the screen, developing a digi digital knowledge hub 
and a framework for dismantling and for the circular business model. Then improve the commissioning and material pre-processing, uh, trying to optimize that and do it uh, in, a, in a way that then you can make the best use of materials. Then use of innovative recycling technologies and adaptation of existing technologies to, to this specific case. And then upgrade, upgraded processes for material reclaiming. So in the next few slides, I'm going to uh, cover the, the impact uh, of, the, of an approach uh, like this. So given the size and the volume of wind turbine blades, uh, there are either that are either appro uh, approaching the commissioning stage or currently in service or projected for installation in the coming years. The development of uh, circular value chains that are resilient and may lead to a reduction of the commissioning times. Uh, that is uh, one of the key, key aspects uh, and the impact that the, this approach would, would make. So those efficiencies uh, do, not, do not exclude the energy consumption the, and the energy generation because the, the potential of those value chains uh, are estimated to have or to be able to deliver an 80 percent uh, reduction uh, in energy use, 87 percent reduction in greenhouse emissions, and also reduce the landfilling by 70 percent. All this uh, related to the, the commission operation. So compared to the to not recycling it, uh, you will get, uh, according to this estimation, you will get those uh, reduced uh, carbon footprint uh, figures. And then the development of the circular value chains involves making positive impact in the scientific and technological plane. In the first place, uh, investment in technology needs to be leveraged to enable the development of existing and new technologies to a scale that can handle effic efficient, efficiently uh, large composite structures in general, and in this case, it would be the wind turbine blades. And of course, there is the development of a reclaiming and reutilization industry, uh, which will have a positive impact in economic and social development. Uh, but that also needs to be uh, achieved because uh, normally uh, industry uses the usual linear approach. So the material that comes out of this uh, type of operations needs to be understood and uh, we need to find out what's the, bet the best use for it. So uh, looking into the, the exploitable results of, uh, of an approach or a project like this, uh, we, we would find that they are linked to technology development required to recycle the wind turbine blades. And um, bear in mind that most of the wind turbines that are approaching the commissioning were made 25 years ago the development of a digital platform and a material passport uh, is key to optimize this assembly sorting and reutilization of materials so we can identify what, what we are processing and then make the best use of it then sometimes you find that information on those materials is not available for old uh, models and toolkits at this level uh, may help to optimize current and, and future blade recycling operations also, the, the commissioning and the blade cut, cutting uh, falls within the, within the realm of applied knowledge and product development. Uh, so these are necessary to sort materials and enable the use of recycling technologies in further stages. And then uh, with all this in mind, the, the project uh, would explore three recycling technologies. Uh, the first one would be low carbon pyrolysis as a means to recover and separate glass fiber and carbon fiber from the polymeric matrix. And then the byproduct uh, may be used as chemical stocks. So all the, the, the product that is not recovered as fiber could, could be then fed into a chemical recycling operation to make new polymers or different products. Then green solvolysis uh, based on green solvents uh, would be used to separate fibers from all the other materials. And finally, there would be processes to enhance the, the value of the recycled fibers and, and ensure that uh, you can retain uh, properties. Those would be things like coatings, sizings, and other aspects that 
can help uh, compatibilize those materials and make the best use of the, the fiber. Um, then moving on to the next slide, uh, that's the implementation stage. Uh, as explained, it's a 48 month uh, project. So now we are in month uh, eight. So the implementation aspect started to, uh, to run a, a few months ago. And uh, the, the focus is to, at this point, is to get. Um, and make sure that uh, all the permits to launch the pilot scale demonstration uh, are in place uh, and that would be probably in late 2024 and early 2025. So this pilot scale demonstration has been divided in two regional hubs, one that is centered in Spain with direct input from UK partners that are participating in the project and another one involving partners located in the north of Europe so uh, this is kind of the implementation plan that we have in place and as you can see uh, both regional hubs uh, are taking into consideration the decommissioning of the wind turbine blades uh, and then developing either cutting dismantling or recycling technology uh, the technologies already mentioned before water jet cutting laser cutting and mechanical cutting and then for the hub that is based in Spain, uh, there would be technology developments around green chemistry solvolysis. And then for the regional hub in the north of Europe, there will be a focus around a co a low carbon pyrolysis uh, facility that is in Germany. So uh, ideally, there will be cross pollination between uh, those two technologies and, and the lessons learned could be uh, shared then both processes, uh, both the uh, solvolysis and the pyrolysis fall under the umbrella term of chemical recycling and will allow to provide fibers in a range of formats uh, free of resin that then can be used uh, for different applications depending on the properties. Uh, it's expected that there is a significant loss uh, in properties to the nominal values of the continuous fibers. Uh, therefore, as I was explaining before, the, um, the sorting upgrading technologies play a critical role in optimizing the use uh, and enable the application of the cascading principle. So uh, potential added value uses for the different types of fiber, uh, as you can see in the, uh, in the right hand side of the screen, include either automotive components, plasterboard applications, for example, uh, ceiling or directly the plasterboard uh, panels and textiles as non-wovens, uh, which Steve was mentioning earlier as well. And then uh, moving on to the valorization, and I think this is the last slide. Um, the key aspect uh, is to define what to do with the materials, how to optimize their management and the further use of the materials uh, down the line within the supply, within the value chain. So the three main routes considered for reclaimed uh, carbon and glass fibers involve either the transformation into non-woven textiles with potential for use in automotive construction and in other wind turbine blades, which would be ideal. Then long fiber compounds for injection and compression molding for mainly for automotive components. And finally, different uses as main, uh, where it would be a main constituent, for example, reinforcement, reinforcement or filler for construction applications, such as the plasterboard example, glass wool or concrete. That's it. And then this is the, the last one. So uh, thank you very much for for your attention and um, I think we are up for questions. Yes, thank you Alberto. So we're a little bit over time. We'll actually take, probably go over time just a little bit as well to go over all the Q&A that we have. I see that we have some questions in the question and answer box. First one, can we receive a PowerPoint document also? Well, I'll direct that to Rocio, who's uh, seeing this from the background. Uh, yeah, you can keep going, Spencer. Go on to the okay. next one. Yeah, thank you. All right. So if you guys have any questions while I'm going through these Q&A, please feel free to add it to the Q&A box, and we'll try and get to them as quickly as we can. So the first question comes from Scott Beckwith. So relative to wind power blades, and maybe considering the helium resin as well, 
what recycled blade materials are showing up in President Biden's infrastructure and or construction 2022 bill? Is there anything related to earthquake, bridge, building, you know, other areas of infrastructure? Yes, Spencer. And, and Scott, thanks for the question. Actually, before Scott's question, Lewis had um, typed in, made a, asked a question about examples for use of, of, of uh, carbon fiber. I sort of blew that one out of the water, I'm afraid. Um, so let me start with that. With carbon fiber sure. materials that are recovered, I think, uh, first of all, Alberta uh, provided a, a pretty nice example where um, short carbon fiber compounded with uh, thermoplastic materials make for high performance injection molded long fiber products. But what we're actually seeing with longer fiber um, from carbon recovered is the application for sheet molding compounds that uh, will find their way into automotive applications, whether they're battery enclosures, battery covers. The, um, the inherent specific stiffness, even in a um, um, random um, sort of um, um, uh, isotropic uh, um, format results in very useful properties that um, are more valuable than uh, we would find with glass fiber sheet molding compound. So I would expect that most of the companies like Carbon Conversions and Vartega that are producing materials from car re recycled carbon fiber will be looking at non-wovens that can then go into those formats and selling materials in those forms, whether it's long fiber injection molding uh, pellets or in long fiber uh, sheet molding compound. Um, Scott, that, that, great question about the infrastructure bill. Um, I, I don't have specific visibility into the line items in the bill, but what we do know and um, is that there are tremendous opportunities in infrastructure for recycled materials. The, what my, one of my examples with the dust under control panels is an example of which we could attack infrastructure with recycled materials. Um, IACME, the, um, the National Network of Manufacturing Institutes, IACME is, uh, has an infrastructure and construction working group that is soliciting um, um, project work from our membership to work on applications for INC that would be funded through um, the infrastructure bill. Um, but that's about the best answer I can give right now. All right. Anything that you wanted to add there, Alberto? Well, I think uh, Steve has covered that uh, quite well. And uh, the one thing that uh, I believe is quite important at this point is uh, just make sure that the the right use or the ca cascade uh, use of the materials uh, can be done in the different applications because uh, there may be a temptation to use the 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 materials uh, because of the volume, especially because of the volume that is going to generate, uh, to use them in applications where then it's very difficult to recover them or it's very difficult to make a further use of them, for example, into concrete uh, or things like that, where you simply put the problem a few years away. So it's very important that the, the ca cascade use of the materials is taken into consideration because then you can let to as Steve said, uh, automotive components, SMCs, BMCs, which is something that you would be able to recycle again and put back in the value chain in a few years' time. So it's about keeping that use for as long as possible, from my perspective. Very good. Spencer, maybe you do one more question since we are over, maybe from Lindy. Yeah, sure. So, question from Lindy Poe Have there been any life cycle analysis studies? done particularly on the act of processing these end of life parts to assess carbon footprint for recycling and the reuse process? Yeah. That, 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 Spencer, that's, that's a critical element, right? Uh, LCA or life cycle analysis to understand both, you know, cradle to gate to, to, to cradle. Um, um, each pathway will have its own specific LCA that could be that could be accomplished to identify the embodied energy required at each stage, upstream, downstream, and in the full life cycle of the product. Um, and and 
I know our organization has sponsored a number of these LCAs for certain segments where the where commonly we don't have that information, such as field level reduction, transportation, some of the processing aspects. So the, the direct answer is yes. Um, one organization to, to plug ACMA has taken an active role in building a database for embodied energy of many of the materials and for templates uh, for life cycle analysis that can support um, um, some and provide answers to some of the uh, advantages or disadvantages of any given end of life pathway that's chosen. But I think it's absolutely critical to understand that for any given um, application and product um, for, for that matter, so that we choose the most effective approaches that are both economically and environmentally sustainable. Great question. Well, I think with that, I'll close it out. So I'm actually going to, I actually share my screen. I was going to make a plug for the SAMPI 365 website. You can see it here at 365.sampi.org free for anybody to create an account up here on the right. And if you actually wanna know what events are coming out, coming out in the next few weeks, click on the events tab. You can see the current one that we're doing right now is the seminar series on wind power. But actually next month, we're gonna be having one on making composite circular, sustainability challenges and opportunities. It'll be moderated by Dr. Drew Chong, assistant professor at USM. And the speaker will actually be Leigh Richardson, global technology director of advanced composites and engineered fibers at the uh, Avian Corporation. So just wanted to have a little bit of plug there for you guys. If you've never actually been to the website, it's free, you don't have to be a SAMPI member. Please join, you'll get all the latest updates. You can actually join one of the technical committees as well. So I think thank with you. that. Yeah, thank you so much, Spencer. Yeah, that, that yeah. was excellent. Thank you to our esteemed uh, speakers, Steve, Alberto, uh, at past your dinner time in Spain. We really are, are grateful for this. Uh, and everyone, please uh, consider uh, learning more about SAMPI.